everyone. My name is Dr. David P. Proden, and welcome to Educational Leadership 655, Pupil Services and Non-Discrimination with Viterbo University in La Crosse, Wisconsin. This week begins on Monday, March 6th, and concludes on Sunday, March 12th, 2023. And yes, this is the final Fireside Chat for this course. A recap, terrific learning team plans for Bruce. You knocked it out of the park. Awesome job to everybody. A few things that I harvested from the different ways that you approached putting together the plan for Bruce. Be overt. Use photos of an EpiPen, a photo of Bruce, images of anaphylactic reaction, for example. Have people hold an EpiPen during a training and replace the word should with must when you have emergency protocols. Should administer the EpiPen gets replaced with must administer the EpiPen if Bruce is having trouble breathing. Proactive measures to mitigate potential bullying or discrimination, which can often be nipped in the bud by demystifying things for kids and staff. What is an EpiPen? What is an allergy? Smart interactions with your food service and your library and media folks with that. A number of you listed books that could be shared with Bruce's classmates and with the schools. Bruce's current district cannot legally resend any medical records to you that the district received through a outside third party. So if the district received a medical report from Bruce's doctor, they cannot send that along to you. That's where you need to work with your school nurse to get a release of information directly with Bruce's physician so you can get that allergy report and recommendations. You will always pair a health plan with an IEP or a 504. A health plan for a severe allergy will never exist on its own. And the reason for that is by pairing it with an IEP or a 504. Okay. Couples it to due process. There's legal due process for 504 and IEP there isn't legal due process for a standalone health plan. So you might want to consult with your school attorney for clarity on that. Some of your plans included sending home a list of acceptable snacks for a peanut-free classroom. That's an awesome idea. Your director of food service will be able to create or obtain those lists. They're pretty ubiquitous. However, just don't go on the website and find someone that has it on a Pinterest site and harvest it from there. You want to make sure you're getting it from a reputable source and also that it is updated every year because manufacturers change the way that they produce things. With school safety, the director of pupil services has an important role to ensure that instruction, devices, and drills are inclusive. There sometimes is nobody else who will advocate or pause the process to consider the value of safety measures and also that the safety instruction, the safety activities are not introducing trauma to students and staff. Remember, early childhood all the way through grade 12. That K-12 counseling scope and sequence document. It's a dynamic asset. Please make sure that you download that and customize it to your district. Out standing questions for the school attorney. I am impressed. Very keen and thoughtful. That's an activity I started to do in my latter years as a pupil services director. It's well worth the time. It's well worth the district to make that investment. So you have 10 questions. You present pupil services themed to the attorney and the attorney answers those and then comes to the district, presents on those to staff. Robust discussions about ICE agents on campus. You know, let me add that when I was a pupil service as director, I mandated that child protective services, so not ICE agents, but child protective services, when they came on campus, I made them identify who they were. And that didn't go over very well. They said, we need to function in some anonymous type fashion. And, and I understand that I was not obstructing their ability to do their job, but I need to know who is coming into the building. And for safety measures, right, we need to know who is coming into our building. And we also need to know who is in our building, for example, if we have a lockdown or if somebody's in the building and they have a medical emergency that we understand who is in our building. So that's something to investigate as a pupil services director when Child Protective Services comes into the building that they are identified by the secretary or whoever is allowing people into the building. Week six, shout out. Kristen wrote for discussion question one about inclusive safety drills. Keep a visual one page 
cage story of the drill, Velcro to the door frame. Rip it off the wall on your way out of the building so that you have resources when you are outside of the building. Practice before the actual drill. Teach students where they can exit safely from the building. That is phenomenal. Kristen, I think that you should share that across your CESA. Actually, it should be something that's shared at a state conference. That is an awesome idea. Amanda asked about the requirements for a school district's annual safety reporting to the Wisconsin DOJ. While the special education or people services director is unlikely to be the person in charge of submitting that information, it's certainly something to be aware of. And depending upon the size of your district, that actually might be a hat that you wear. So the DOJ requires schools to conduct an annual violence drill. That's actually the term that they use, violence drill. So what does that mean with emphasis to include outside agencies. Report findings of the drill to your board of education. So I linked it out so you understand those obligations. Also the report, all of that is due to the DOJ on January 1st, New Year's Day every year. Kind of strange, but that is the requirement. It's trendy to hire safety companies to come in and conduct these drills, conduct these violence drills that, that suffice to meet the DOJ requirements, but be aware of how those drills are conducted it, potential activities, again, that might introduce trauma to staff, to students. And also, what are the objectives of these activities? Part of the Department of Justice requirement is that you submit blueprints of your schools. I made a blog post in November and also a tightly edited YouTube video to explain how to plan and carry out a multi-agency school safety exercise with measurable categories or objectives. I post a link to that post and that video in this week's module. So please, please check it out. Ashley responded to discussion question two by submitting three people services themed questions for her school's attorney. One of her questions was, mental health and drug overdoses are a growing concern for our community. Instruction is taught regarding drugs and alcohol for one semester in high school. It does not seem like enough. Students are suspended for drug use and do not need to sign behavior documents or take courses to return to school. As a district, how can we begin to to address our community's growing needs and keep our students and families safe and healthy. So that is, that's an area of drug uh, overdoses, opioids, that is, it's growing and wrought with legal questions. Boil that down even more. Boil it down. Well, it's maple syrup season, right? In March in Wisconsin, March, April. So let's, let's get out the, the boiling pot and put these questions and boil them down for the school attorney. So I would take that and, and go a few steps further and ask questions. For example, what are the district's legal legal considerations when it comes to placing Narcan in the AED boxes on campus. What are the district's legal considerations if requiring students to participate in drug counseling prior to re-entry into the school? Lauren responded to discussion question two, how do schools handle social media being used outside of school that is impacting student welfare inside of the school? What kinds of actions can administrators and teachers take to prevent issues in social media from affecting students in school? That is an excellent question and a matter that is likely to surface periodically throughout the school year. So that's a great question to put before the school attorney because likely, right, you're going to be addressing this throughout the school year. Furthermore, some Wisconsin cities now have bullying ordinances. So be aware of that. Does your city actually have a bullying ordinance? In 2016, Shawno's city council passed the anti-bullying ordinance. Under the new ordinance, parents will be warned if police determine their child bullied another child. Typically, this is in the community. Parents have 90 days to address their child's behavior. If their child continues to exhibit bullying behavior, the parent will be issued a $366 fine. If the child receives another bullying, offense, parents will be fined $681. Again, Shawano, Wisconsin, a city ordinance doesn't have anything to do specifically with the school. Another branch of this question would be, what are the legal considerations for school officials to intervene in social media harassing of staff by parents or outside groups? What is protected free speech? What is slander? What is libel? What if a staff member is allegedly being bullied through a parent's blog? That seems kind of strange, right? Because in the school setting, at 
309, we bullying policy, bullying investigation. But what if a staff member is the recipient of perceived bullying, but it is originating from a parent or an outside agency? Again, not threats, but we're saying bullying that is maybe occurring in a social media blog post or something to that effect. How does the school intervene with that? And what I've found so far is most schools do not intervene with that. They perceive that as an out of school. This is a terrific question for your school attorney and also to understand your principal and your board of education, what they perceive their role to be, which might be that they would say this is protected under First Amendment free speech. The school district is not going to do anything with this. That does happen. What is protected under free speech. Staff will think you should jump into this, that the school should jump into this, the school's legal counsel, the principal and and administration, and and it's not that clear. So again, that is a terrific question. Lauren, week seven in Moodle. This is the final week for discussion questions. You are not required to make any discussion question post or substantive post after week seven. Disability self-advocacy. You'll meet a student from Toma, a student who attended the Wisconsin School for the Blind and a staff member from the Wisconsin School for the Blind. They will talk about their own disability. They've done that in an effort to educate others in the school setting. Imagine this expanded to students with anxiety or identifying as LGBTQ. How might this personal self-advocacy or education benefit the student and the school? And what are possible drawbacks to these types of student-led activities? An immediate consideration would be that the student and family need to be comfortable with sharing personal information that would otherwise be protected by HIPAA. Another concern is that one person's story does not represent the group. Final disability simulation activities such as having ambulatory people use a wheelchair to go through a lunch line or weave through obstacles in a hallway has been criticized by some as giving a false impression of what it's like to have that authentic disability, what it's like to sit in a wheelchair for eight hours a day and to have sore from that. This is similar to schools that have done planned homeless for a night experiences where students might camp overnight on the football field inside of a cardboard box. And the thought there is that those activities help to bring some sense of awareness to the students or to the participants. I think there's merit in that. There certainly is. But also we need to make sure that when we take that on, we're having discussions that that does not represent what that authentic experience is like. Abeyance agreements. Well, (laughs) I've talked about these a few times because I'm very passionate about abeyance agreements and not many people talk about them. And you need to know that abeyance agreements are not codified by law. As they appear, they can contribute to discrimination. For example, if applied repeatedly to certain students, the abeyance agreement could be separating that student from the services that would help address the root cause of what is why that behavior is manifesting. Upload your FEMA course completion certificate by March 12th. Keep that on record. Use that when you apply for your next administrative position. In the syllabus, week six and seven are still combined. So this week is the same as last week. Read chapters 18 and 28 in School of Airs, and there are no reflective teaching annotations for the remainder of the course. Over the next few weeks, and I will post this under announcements, I will create the Google shared document with different times. So you can schedule out your 20 minute phone call final with me. That's what you want to do. You can do the paper. It's up to you. And we will start those toward the end of March and finish those phone call finals in early April. But folks, we are in the last month of this class, the home stretch. You've done a wonderful job. And now that we are close to entering the research module, uh, things will slow down quite a bit. And you have plenty of time to go and to ask people about different from pupil services, components, and how things work in your district to inform that final assignment. I think you're going to really uh, find value in that FEMA course and spend a little bit of time because there are numerous other courses that FEMA offers. I did share a link to those too. That is incredible professional development at no cost to you. You have the record of it then with the certificate. So a great benefit to you. Everybody enjoy this warming weather and And don't forget to turn your clock forward because we are now going to have more sunlight, spring, good stuff. Thank you, everybody. And we're almost to the finish line. Great job. (laughs) 